All right, so welcome everybody. Today is LinkedIn Home Day Hangout. Super excited. I've got Tracy here. I'll give her an intro in a minute. Uh, but for all you new folks, we do have two rules. Sorry, two goals. Goal number one, we're going to learn how to use LinkedIn. Goal number two, we're going to have fun. Uh, and the one rule is no being a troll, no being a jerk. All right, cool. So uh, a few months back, I applied to be in the LinkedIn events beta group. I thought for sure I'd get in. I did not get in. I cried just a little bit. And then one day I was on my phone and I saw that the events thing was there and I could push plus new and I freaked out and I was like, oh my gosh, I took a screenshot and I actually shared it. And I said, Tracy, because we talked about it in the past. I said, Tracy, I have access to LinkedIn events. And it was like the same day or the next day, like, oh, and I was like, oh shoot, I should check this out. So I'm seeing a whole bunch of people that did not apply to be in the beta group now getting LinkedIn events. Uh, I believe it's coming out to English, uh, to USA. They said English speaking on the documentation, but probably US first. That's usually how they do it. And then, um, so I started messing with it and I realized I don't know events very well. <laughs> and so I figured I'd say, Tracy, will you please come and explain to this group, like give us some professional insights because Tracy is a professional events, everything. Genius. All right. So Tracy, take the wheel. It's all yours. Uh, and yeah, let's have fun. Well, thanks, Isaac. I mean, I, I love that you call me a professional because you have actually experienced my events. So That's I feel true. like you That's have the right you. to say that. We didn't just meet on LinkedIn. Um, we have actually experienced one another in real life, which makes it extra fun, um, which is why events are awesome. Good segue. It's a shared experience. Yeah. You saw each other. You had facial expressions. The same reason that Zoom is valuable, a shared experience at an event is valuable. Uh, yeah. People still pay money to go to a movie theater for a reason. We love the shared experience and having the, this time together with a group of people where we're doing the same thing, experiencing the same thing. And for me, I love B2B events. Um, I only do corporate and nonprofit events because they have an ROI in mind. Yeah. And, and so everything that we do is crafting an event, trying to find how do we move people from where we are to where we want them to be through a shared experience. And so it's all built with that in mind um, and ways to reach people, reach our audiences. Um, the, these tools like LinkedIn events, that that's what's really valuable to us at, as we keep moving forward and building our community. Um, for me, because I am B2B and fairly niche in an in industry, um, LinkedIn's the only place where I spend my time. I don't push any marketing efforts out to Instagram or Facebook. I, I mirror some things over there, um, but I don't spend time there. And so to have all of that in one place for me is really exciting um, because that's where I'm really cultivating a network of people that I want to share time with. Mm. And, and so having it all together, I mean, like you experienced, having multiple platforms makes things tricky because yeah. people will go to one trying to find information to another and, and you end up sending them to multiple places. Um, and as StoryBrand would say, when you confuse, you lose. It just makes things harder for people and they don't want to do hard things. So we try really hard to make things as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a little bit of digging and we had so yes. much fun teasing each other on LinkedIn events because you popped up, I have LinkedIn events. <laughs> and I laugh because then I went, oh, I wonder if they're rolling it out. And I pulled it out because we both applied yeah. and just sat there waiting and drying our tears. Yeah. And, and sure enough, I go in there and, and I have events and I You're get to not pop special. up on you. You're not special, Isaac. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, man. I have events too. And, uh, but it is going in and um, playing with it and seeing sort of the, the pros and the cons. Um, it is very, very clear to me that LinkedIn wants us to be hosting physical events. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, like the, there is zero debate in the event setup <laughs> process. 
in the in the scheduling of the reminders. Uh, so three hours ahead of the event, it popped up with a LinkedIn notification for me saying you have an event coming up and I'm thinking all I have to do is log into Zoom. I don't need three hours. Oh, you want me to have a physical mm. event. Good insight. You, yeah. You, you want me to be planning to travel somewhere. Uh, yeah, and so the, the fact that they require a street address. Mm hmm. Uh, the fact that the the pop-ups are timed for a physical event tells me that's really what they're going for. For sure. And then I think you can find that even further if you actually look at the terms and conditions. Yes. Which I don't know if anybody else looked at these. I did. I I violated them. But <laughs> but get. Sorry. But kindly. I'm, yeah. You yeah. kindly, gently, you sort of. You have um, to you have to unpack those for us, Tracy. Yeah. So a lot of what I do in my job um, is read contracts and save my clients from them because to be an event planner and sort of see what's coming as far as what you're trying to accomplish and how those terms and conditions rules um, could affect what you're trying to accomplish. That's a regular piece of what I do. Uh, and so I went in and I read them and I went, hmm. Um, I think 90% of the people aren't going to read this and they're going to break the rules. So, um, like, I love the do's and don'ts, just their professional community policies. They're saying, you know, keep it professional, respectful, and safe. That's phenomenal. Um, you get down to bullet point number three. It says you will not use the services to communicate or administer a promotion. Interesting. Um, so... The, this is not an event to sell your services. This is yeah. not an event for a promotion. This is meetups and career fairs and continuing ed uh, professional development. Uh, I think that's really what they're saying they want to have happen yeah. through this platform. Um, they also require that you maintain reasonable insurance against loss or damage. Mm, like property casualty? property casualty, yeah. liability. Um, and so mm. you see that a lot on a physical venue where they want you to have insurance, but here's Zoom, um, pardon me, here's LinkedIn events saying, you're gonna have to have insurance if you're using our platform to tell people about your event. Um, and, and so I thought that that was really interesting and permits and licenses as well. Um, mm. Because what most people don't understand is that permits and licenses also counts for any media that you're sharing. So if you don't own the content and you're sharing it, you could be violating permits and licenses. Wow. And you could have those people come after you, but then additionally LinkedIn events could come after you for having violated that as well. So you could end up with a double whammy there. Wow. So those kind of things are like gotchas that I want you to be really careful of. Um, aware of. They're things that um, I think really oftentimes pertain to um, tangible events, which is another clue that that's what they want you to be having is in-person events. Mm -hmm. um, they also say farther down, you can't use the data collected through the event with a bot. Mm. Oh, so, do they say with a bot or? They, they say, say with a bot? Specifically with huh. a bot. Interesting. So even though you now have a group of contacts that connections that you don't necessarily have their email or their phone, and you can't use a scraper to get those out of their profiles, mm -hmm. also stated directly, yeah. you can't use a bot as your follow up. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it, it's they're doing their best to protect people, I think, from probably what happened two years ago, where People sort of abused the, the virtual sales side of it uh, and they just pulled the plug. And, um, and that's sort of the other piece to be careful of is that anytime uh, that you're depending on a platform that you don't control to share information with your community, you're at the risk of them deciding to no longer have that platform. Mm -hmm. And so as you have where you're sending out emails, you're using Zoom, whose job is to do video calls, um, they're not going to pull the plug on you. 
but LinkedIn may remove the event from LinkedIn. And so your marketing method may change at their discretion. Mm. So that's the other piece to be careful of. Yeah. And, and those are the gotchas. I love, love how easy it is to share with your contacts. I love how, like, just punching invite and having all of my connections right there and going down the line and going, yep, that would be valuable to them. That would be valuable to them. I'd love to have them in the conversation. That was phenomenal. Um, having it where you could share it to your profile. Well, that's a whole nother audience, not just the people mm -hmm. I hand selected, but the people that you're connected to and, and that you know, tree of people that goes out from there, all the branches. So from that standpoint, it's phenomenal as a tool. Uh, but there's some very definite gotchas as it exists right now. Yeah. Did you, would now be time? Can we take like one minute and do a screen share? And just if no one has created an event, just show them what it looks like. Yes. Are you able to do that or would you like me to? Sure. All right. So there's the terms and conditions. So you can kind of see those. Um, this down here, we have events. And you can see I started creating one for our first meetup post conference. Uh, this is the one that we're in right now. Maybe. I'm wondering how I'm wondering how long it takes for those to be gone because I could see that getting really cluttered real fast. Um, yeah, we'll have to watch that. Yeah. So this is ours that we're on. Um, like I think that the start the conversation is gonna be the place where we really find um, the follow-up communication to start um, and then allowing people to opt into a communication from there. You know, maybe they're signing up for your email list. Um, and then... Mm, that's actually a great strategy. I want to talk strategy here as well. Did you see anywhere, Tracy, after the event expires, does the page become deleted or does it just live forever? Um, I, I don't know yet. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't uh, find that. I, yeah, I don't have a past event and I couldn't find anybody talking about it because there's really very little conversation on this yet. Yeah. Um, people are using it casually. Uh, and so the the depth of data that I'm looking for uh, just doesn't exist out there yet. Okay. Um, and I and I only started playing with it. So uh, sure. it's going to be really fun to see what we can do with it. So much like you would have a profile you create the event, you get to change the background picture, the header picture, you get to put a little profile. So for me, um, I did a picture from the conference with audience, and then I did the logo in the profile. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, you a question? Get a, yeah. Can I, do you think that it could go either way as far as the, the square image there, your profile picture or the company logo, depending on what the event's about? I think it just depends on if you're marketing the personal brand or the company brand. Yeah. Um, in, in our case, it's, you know, it's Kevin Kwok and I who have put the conference together and um, I, it was easier to put our conference logo because we're really building that community um, than the Kevin and Tracy show. Cause that's really not, what it is so for us it made far more sense for it to be the logo that people would recognize from on stage at the conference um, and then just something that showed community that showed people talking and smiling um, and especially when you have a past event it, i think it's fun people always love to see themselves and are they may not love to see themselves but they love being quasi famous mm -hmm. uh, that they're online and the event name, you want to be really, really specific. Um, don't try to get super fancy and flowery. You want it to be as descriptive and succinct as possible so that when people see only this tiny little piece, they know exactly what it is. Um, and so if it's a quarterly, uh, you know, I would encourage you to put like a Q1 or a Q2 in there so that people can easily identify a recurring um, that it shows up easily for them. They can go back and find it. Um, the location we kind of talked about, it's really tricky 
because it does require a street address. Um, and only once you've put in most of a street address does it give you the drop down. So it can be a little bit frustrating in that first pass. Um, venue details, the coaching they give is like add the floor and the room number. Um, I would also say if there's parking or accessibility mm. questions, yeah. um, if there's any other information that would help people, I always say try to craft your event for an introvert. Introverts want all the information up front. So give them as much information as possible. Um, date, time, time zone, um, and then description. Things that will be included, what won't be included, anything you recommend that they bring, those are all really valuable things. In your case, with the virtual, it's, hey, we're gonna meet on Zoom, go sign up here, right? Which I, um, I would not recommend going that route because I think it's just against the rules. So just for everybody watching, sorry. Yeah, I'll have that. <laughs> um, so the ticketing website, I'm looking forward to playing with. I'm not entirely sure how this one works. Um, I know that it's a little cumbersome um, on the Facebook side of things because of the third party um, I love to use Eventbrite. That's what I've standardized on professionally because it's super, super powerful, has a bunch of plugins and logistics and analysis that uh, makes my job easier. And so for me, that would end up being an Eventbrite link. Um, and then these settings, you can't change it after you create the event. So be careful about what you choose. Uh, because you would end up having to delete and recreate the event if you change it. Um, so public event, anyone, everyone, they could go search it and find you. Private event uh, could be only invitees or you can extend it out to the people that they've invited through their connections. So that's the basics of it. Um, and this is where you can find the terms and services. Um, which is worth giving a good read, even though it's boring, because it is. You should read it. You should read all of it. And no, I mean really all of it. And uh, that's those are the words of my favorite lawyer, Chris Brown, who's here in KC. And uh, and that's that's the quick tour. Um, it is a matter of being careful about how that's now going to show up here in events with that description. Could, could you go to the plus new? Could I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah, what you got? So for the names, yeah. uh, I was thinking about this earlier uh, yesterday because so you guys know what BNI is, right? Lots of, they're global, lots of yep. local meetups. So there's, I think a lot of synergy between what they're doing and then what you can now do on LinkedIn. The thing there is uh, there, it's all BNI, but there it's recurring and it's, there's lots of meetings in the same Metro. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on naming conventions? And I kind of talked a minute, like add Q3, Q4, that kind of thing. But what are your thoughts on naming conventions for an organization that does a lot of events like that? And um, so, I would start out because I think who you're hoping to attract are new people. Uh, I know that BNI has uh, like chapter names. I don't know what a chapter name means as far as where it is in the metro area. So the first thing you're going to want to tell people is where it is in the metro area. Um, and then the, the when it is because that's the next important piece of information. And, and then later on, you're going to get to a chapter name. Um, people are going to need to have that as a searchable piece of information, but they're not necessarily going to need that if what you're looking for is finding them in a, in a search, in a, a looking for a place to plug in from outside of the organization. Um, if you're only serving the internal organization, then absolutely use chapter names. Uh, but it's a matter of who your audience is and so who that makes sense for. Yeah. I'm, I would not be surprised if they eventually added recurring as an option. I, I'll, I'll also be curious. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll check and see after this event here expires. I think at, technically at 11 o'clock central it does. I'm wondering if you can go in and edit an expired event and then just change the dates. 
could be one way to do it. I, I would love that mm -hmm. to retain the engagement and that kind of stuff. Right. Right. Because that's what you lose when it's a fresh event, right? People roll off, they have to opt back into it. Any of the conversation pops yeah. out. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you'd run into a, a problem where somebody said yes to one event, they're an attendee, but then they might not be attending the new dates. So, something to think about there, too. Right. Especially if you're, as an organizer, taking initiative to engage with them, they might go, That was like last year. <laughs> Well, and, and I'd say then what you're talking about is running a group and the group is really what people are feeding into for engagement and the event are instances within the group. Yeah. Well, Tracy, uh, Tracy and Isaac, I have another meeting that I've got to hop on to, um, but I appreciate uh, the knowledge and it was good linking up with you guys today. You too, John. See you, bud. All right. We'll see you. For the, we hadn't talked about this yet, the location where yep. you require the street address, just so everybody knows, since Google's king and I call Bing backseat Bing, Microsoft owns LinkedIn and Bing. So when you're choosing your venue, LinkedIn's gonna look at Bing. So since Bing I think is neglected as far as like SEO is concerned and business listings, you'll wanna make sure that that is accurate. Just FYI. Stands to reason. Yes. All right, so after you create the event, Tracy, uh, can you tell us, can you share some insight on, I think like the, you really gain traction after you create the event and there's that engagement and the promotion. Do you have any mm -hmm. insight on that for, for this platform? And then also how like there's a crossover with Eventbrite and that kind of stuff. Any, any thoughts there? Um, so you're always going to want to make it as simple as possible for everybody. Um, I always look at it and say, you want to get the event out there as early as you have the details on it. Uh, so in, in this case, once you have the venue, the date and the time figured out, that's an event. Um, and you can start putting that out there as a save the date in effect. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're, you're creating these regular touch points that add to the story of what it is you're doing and what's coming up. Uh, so whether that's content that you'll be sharing, snippets of that, um, stories of the people that are going to be there, uh, you're trying to define the audience as best you can and share that with the people who have given enough interest to say yes to the event or maybe to the event. And so we wanna make sure that all of those opportunities happen with a regular touch point, as with any marketing. Uh, you want to make sure that you just have this ongoing conversation with the audience so that when the day comes, they're not surprised by it. They have all the information. They know that they're the one it's for and they're in. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, we create the event as soon as we have the details, depending on how far you're out, far out you are. That might be once a month or once a week. Uh, and then you're making sure that in that last week, that's at least an everyday touch point so that people see it coming. Mm. You'd be amazed the number of people. They're like, oh, that's tomorrow? It's, yeah. I've been telling you for three months that that's the I date. Guess. But, After but we started yes, yeah. tomorrow. Uh, and, and I'll tell you too that the timeline and the trickiness of those communications change as well based on where your event falls in the month. So when your event is in the very first week of the month, like this is a week that I would never tell a client to have a November event because yeah. people are looking at the calendar and going, but it's October. I'm like, right. Mm -hmm. No, Friday's November. Yeah. So if you're inviting people to a November 1st event, they may not pay attention to the fact that that's this Friday. Yeah. So there's some psychology in the dates as well. That's fascinating. So, so create the event, have maybe like the speakers should be sharing in that yeah. feed. Can I uh, hop over? Can I take over and drive with the screen share? Give me one second so that people can kind of see this live. All right. So we're going to go here. So I created the event. I can, I can do whatever with content. Are you able to, as an attendee, 
to do same kind of things like you're a member of a group and while you're while you're looking yes uh, i can start a conversation in the event same way awesome awesome so i feel like that's both awesome and scary so you can have you know your your speakers share content especially if they're well known that can be a big draw mm -hmm. uh, and i'm specifically talking about within the event page and I, yeah you have the speaker share it you can do like little teasers build engagement like you're saying um where it kind of scares me is there are some weirdos out there and if anybody can start a conversation you might somebody could be trolling some could say something awful somebody could be just whatever that's a, a reliability so i'm i guess you can i can't okay so i organize this event chris love that guy i can't delete that mm -hmm. which i find interesting i didn't know that until just now <laughs> so wow. some, so something to may you as an organizer you might need to make sure you're monitoring this just for like you know quality control if something weird goes on top you might need to bury it right right so something um, there. that's yeah yeah um yeah this just really quick on click-through rates so i geeked out a little bit uh if you're using for ticketing something else you know like some events you just show up to right mm -hmm. sometimes you need to register sometimes you need to pay i'd be curious i don't have a lot of data on this i'd be curious what the attendee rate is to the the actual registration is if you require registration because it's like when you invite somebody and if they say yes it's not like they're actually saying yes it's like they're raising their hand going yeah i'm interested in going right like that, that doesn't mean that they're going and it doesn't mean that they'll register so i uh, because I, your only option on linkedin events is yes or no it, yeah exactly and then linkedin doesn't actually handle at least not right now the like more than that so of the 32 uh, that of this for like this private event here 32 attendees there was about a 20 percent click through right here okay. and i think that i think that well actually that i'm sure that increased because i got a bunch of emails about it after we started recording so latecomers mm -hmm. so something to think about there too is i think you'll want to re do a lot more than just rely on this link Mm -hmm. And so what I do is, and I did this because of the location thing, see all, and I just, they're all purple because I viewed all their profiles, <laughs> but you can just go through and if you need to maybe make sure that they have a specific detail, like the ticket URL, like, Hey, just so you know, saw you said yes, but just, you can't actually get on the doors unless you bought for this ticket. Right. You might need to take the extra step and go in and, and go through the process where Maybe you send them a connection request with a message about it. Maybe you send them an in-mail. Not everybody has in-mail because they don't have a, a paid account. So something to be aware of there just to increase the actual registration. Yeah. Right? And, and potentially that's the, um, you know, start a conversation mm -hmm. where you're giving additional instructions. Uh, and I mean, you've experienced this. There's a lot of times where people just don't read instructions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you kind of have to hit them two or three different ways to get the point across. Uh, but like you said, that personal touch is amazing. Yeah. Seriously feel, amazing. And they feel uh, like they're excited to see you when yeah. they get there. It's, and I almost feel like it takes some of the awkwardness out being able to do this because an email is an email. It could have been sent from somebody. I have never seen their face or anything, but if I can creep on the profile, and I don't know anybody at the event, I might go there and be like, I'm looking for that person. Or I'm seeing these people and I'm like, oh, if I get an email communique, I don't know who else is necessarily going. If I go like this, I'm like, oh, I actually know some of these people. That's cool. And then the, there's the organizer. That's what they look like. If I see them, it's going to be less awkward for me when I'm there, especially more introverted. Well, that's what you did. That's what I did. Be before the event, he scoped me out and he's like, hey, I'm going to be there. I hope we get to meet. Seriously? Wait, I did do that. Go, so, man. She's talking about the event that she hosted in Casey, not today's thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Way, way, way back. I don't know what that was last year sometime. 
Yeah, and, life's a blur. Uh, and, and so I got this message that said, hey, I'm going to be at this event that you're running. And, and I hope we get to connect. And sure enough, we connected and friends connected and figured out that we had a bunch of other connections. And, mm -hmm. and that's the fun of an event. It pulls you outside of the computer driven network into a much more chaotic space as far as who you're going to meet next. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight, Tracy, on as an organizer after the event using this kind of data here for like follow up, that kind of thing? Tell them thank you. Tell them um, thank you. Tell them thank you. It's amazing. Well, what, if they didn't, so, what if they didn't attend though? Well, then you tell them, hey, you know, was there something specific you hope to get out of this? Because we missed you. It, it's that genuine, boy, what we were doing would have added value to your day, but obviously something happened that you weren't able to come. Can we still be a value provider? I think that's really good. But if you're, if it's a big event, you're not going to know who actually walked in the doors or not. Uh, if you're running a secondary event like Eventbrite, you're going to have a report to consolidate oh, against it. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Because I have check-ins at the door, whether it's paid or not. That's why she's a pro. Cool. And you can uh, do that. The, the easiest way to do that on a non-paid event is to print name tags in advance for everybody who said they were going to be there. And instead of having to try to do all of the check-in live, because um, that's overwhelming to a lot of people, um, instead of having to do that live, just take the name tags that were left on the table at the end of the event and use those as your follow-ups. That's really good too. That's really good. Do you, could you see a situation where you might have a bad, a bad player in here who goes, so here's what I'm thinking. So if someone says, yes, I'm, in, I'm interested in going, to this event, what this shows me is all of these people are expressing interest in this topic. And that might be information that I could not find anywhere else, right? And so what you could do, maybe this is good, maybe it's bad, maybe it depends on just how you do it. You could say yes to an event if it expresses like an interest where maybe, like what if you're selling to that group? And then you could actually create your own list and go through and, and prospect these people. There's probably a good way to go about that and a bad way. But that I'm sure that. that's I'm sure that's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and I had um I attended a job fair just to meet recruiters once. Is that where you met Chris? No. Okay. Cool. Uh, what but, about but there are. I mean, you're always going to have people who are trying to get into an audience. Yeah, and yeah. when you're doing it respectfully, when you're participating in the community at the same time, I don't think anybody faults you for that. Um, it's when you're a terrible creeper and we all mm -hmm. get mad at you for naysaying an event that you wish was yours. Um, or for mimicking an event word for word, right? Like that's, that's the other piece of it too. So you're always going to have bad apples. It's, it's being hopeful that you've surrounded yourself with enough community that they kind of weed those people out naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could see also if I'm an attendee, I might go through this list and just connect with people beforehand so that when I get to the event, I'm not in that awkward moment where you're like, I don't know anybody here and we're all kind of eating chips and who do I talk to and what do we talk about? So if you can start that conversation on LinkedIn and you get there, I feel like you'd be, you'd be more confident, more comfortable, mm -hmm. and then you probably like draw people to you once you've got that well, happen. Absolutely. And how often, you know, do you go through a list of names and you're like, oh, I know them. They're going to be there. Okay. And you send them a little message. And you're like, Hey, I, I'm really excited to see you there. Right. And, and then additionally from an event organizer standpoint, I love that kind of social accountability. Right. That's a, now that's you're great. not just letting me down when you don't show up, you're letting your friend down when you don't show up. That's so, so true. Having that group dynamic is really valuable from my side of things. Yeah. Like the accountability of the tribe. Mm-hmm. 
there's a a phrase called uh, I think it's called the network effect. We're right. I, I could be coining that wrong. So is going to be like, listen, this is my world. But so the more people use it, the more valuable it becomes. And so I have found when, like on Facebook, it's Saturday. I'm like, what are we going to do uh, with the wife and kids today? And the, it says like, my friends so and so are going to this event in my town. And I'm like, that's cool. Like the more people I see that I know they're going, the more likely I am to commit to actually traveling. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're describing to here as an attendee. The more people that are, are not, not just going to the page, but going here to see who's attending and that kind of thing, the more likely they'll be to actually go. Right. Cause you may not know me from Joe, right? You, but when you have part of your tribe attending, all of a sudden you've got a party table. And, yeah. and for me as well, from the event standpoint in total, I, I'm always looking for ways to cultivate that because when you're having fun in an event, it's contagious. That's very and, true. And we get a higher interaction rate. We get more conversation. We get more questions. It's just a ton of fun when you can get a really live audience in a room and everybody walks away feeling like they were part of the inside jokes. They were in that community. Uh, and it's just, it plays for a very different event. I totally agree. Can I, can I ask you some questions? Does anybody else want to, want to, Take a shot before I, for us, Tracy, anybody? Dave, Sigvinder, Scott. Scott, you've had your mic off this whole time. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go for it then. Uh, so here, what are your thoughts on, you talked about this a little bit, but the, va the value, how it, does it differ for like LinkedIn events, Facebook events, like event right exclusively, you know, like obviously different kinds of events might do better on other platforms. Any thoughts on for LinkedIn? Like who is it most valuable for? Uh, LinkedIn is B2B. Uh, I think that we all agree to that for the most part. Um, we have some occasions where uh, the social kind of bleeds over into it. Uh, which is really fun. We're seeing more and more of that where you get a little piece of who I am personally as well, um, because I think everybody in, appreciates when we live sort of that authentic integrated life. Um, the, but the, the value for me, Facebook is much more social. Um, I'm going to get friendships and um, and family groups far more than I'm going to get business connections and professional relationships. And uh, so as far as an investment goes, if I want to go hang out with my friends, that's probably Facebook. If I want to learn something new and meet more people who are doing and playing in the, the business realm where I am, that's going to be LinkedIn. And so to have an event on LinkedIn where I'm doing that makes the most sense for me. So I think that's really high value. The challenge is that it's new. You've got a really big learning curve for a lot of people. Um, and as with everything, I, I mean, Eventbrite is super, super powerful, but from a marketing standpoint, you still have to figure out how to get people over there. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you're still mm -hmm. using all of the platforms to drive people over to Eventbrite where potentially with LinkedIn, especially if it's a free event, um, but with LinkedIn, you're all resident in one place. And so there, there is value in that. You know what, I could see um, you using a LinkedIn event for an event that's not necessarily B2B, but to help the event. Like I'm thinking uh, there was an aviation show here in Lee Summit, totally not a LinkedIn thing, right? It's like you go with your, your family, they have helicopter rides, you can check out airplanes, they have like a Vietnam chopper with bullet holes. That's totally not a LinkedIn thing. But if I was the airport where that happened and I was wanting to bring in the aviation people that 
like help run that event, I might create the event not to market it to the consumer, but to draw the professionals that contribute to it. Correct. That and might I think be you really, you, you really hit it because what we go back to talking about is audience. Yeah. And yeah. so you really, you have to define your audience when you start talking about promoting events and then you have to meet them where they are. And I love the creative twist on it because um, it, it is, you know, when you talk about, I, I need volunteers for something. Well, it may not be a professional event, but I may be needing to reach college students who are looking for more experiences. Well, that might be a LinkedIn question because they're out there trying to push into new career spaces. Well, come spend a day or two days or three days helping me with a professional activity, my profession. Oh, yeah. You could use it to recruit volunteers. Maybe even nonprofits could do that too. Right. Right. Wow. And, mm -hmm. and so you could learn more about the event planning profession doing a thing that isn't necessarily your business yet, or maybe isn't your business. Maybe you think events are just interesting and you might need to use some of that information as you go forward. And, and those are the kind of people that I'm really looking for, for volunteers. Like I love having people who are young and driven, want to learn a new skill and will come and work shoulder to shoulder with me because they're young and they're driven and they want to learn. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's all of these different places where we can play with it. What do you think, Tracy, about like, uh, so Dave does, what, okay, what's the, what's the best way to say compliance? Uh, about the accessibility aspect, yeah, that's a big area right now is web accessibility. So, so web ex digital experiences accessible for people with disabilities. So can, so accessibility is, what, is the best thing to, mm -hmm. so I, don't, I, don't, I, don't yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So just well, it's things like when I coach my nonprofits, when they send out a letter, it can't all be an image. It has to actually be readable text because if they're using a reader that reads the text to them, an, an image does them no good. Oh, mm -hmm. exactly. So my so we we have to be careful when we craft events so that even if I have a a big thumbnail that says, "Hey, this is what we're doing." What, like yours, LinkedIn, Hump Day Hangouts, I have to duplicate that in a readable text space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For accessibility. So, so what are your thoughts, Tracy, on if Dave wanted to do a, an event? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course you can't, the, from the terms, you can't like be, it can't be a sales event. Can Dave create like a, like a workshop or an info meeting at a tangible place where he's, because uh, for Dave, with it, with web accessibility, uh, education and knowledge is a big part because a lot of people are totally unaware of it. So it's part of the funnel anyways. Can Dave do an event where it's like, hey, I'm going to tell you what you need to know, business owners, about this topic. And since Dave's given the presentation, Dave becomes the natural expert. And then Dave can follow up with that in real life community after that event. Correct. You think I that think would that's be a the kosher? ideal way to do it? You're okay. you're trying to give people uh, an experience that forwards their knowledge, their abilities, um, and their questions, and so you're going to put them into a space where they can experience what the problem is, and then you're going to affirm that you have a solution for the problem. And, it's not being and, super. Yeah. No, it, it's not being salesy. It's it's giving value. Uh, and, and so the same way that, you know, we're going to sit here and we're going to talk about events. Well, do I do event coaching, consulting, and planning? Yes. Does everybody know that? Yes. Do I need you as a client? Probably not. That's cool. If you have other resources, you should go and use them. Um, but now you know that I'm a resource in the community. Um, and that's really what it's about. And so I, I tell anyone, go out and just add value. Um, put yourself in a place where you get to be the one sharing what you've learned. And, and we all have fun talking about that. Dave, I'm sure has tons of stories of why this is valuable, what it looks like, what you can do, the first easy step. 
And to put people in a room, man, I would say sit them down in a room, put some weird goofy glasses on them, put headphones on them, make it hard for them to experience the internet. Oh, that's so good. So that they actually know this is what people are yeah. dealing with. This is the deficit that I'm trying to overcome as a designer, as a developer, as a creator, so that now they're gonna go sit down at their computer and think about building something and go, oh, I remember how hard that was. How do we change this? And, oh and you can't do that in the virtual space as easily, right? You mm -hmm. can make them feel a tangible physical response that yeah. they then carry with them. That's so good. I'm geeking out. <laughs> so Dave, you could pull up, like you could invite people, have them put, if you could do whatever, and then say, did you know this percentage of your audience has accessibility issues? Did you know that this is how, how do you feel? This is how they feel about you when they're on their way, your website right now. Yeah. That's good. And you can't do that on LinkedIn. It has to be in real life. It's good. And I have one question on this. If, if it's the term say you can't use the event as a sales pitch, what if the event itself is a sale? In other words, it's a tick, it's a paid ticketed event because there are free workshops to do just basic knowledge. But part of what I'm planning is paid workshops. And there's a lot of consultants doing this now where it's like a half day intensive workshop that could be a thousand dollars or something. Is LinkedIn okay with the event itself being a sale, if you will? That's they, a they don't have any problem with you jumping out to a ticketing website. Okay. So I'm going to say that that's not an issue at all, just based on the way that they've built the event creation. Okay. Uh, so it, I think that there's a value that they are willing to assign for an event. And especially when you're talking about a workshop, you're, you're not necessarily just trying to pitch a mm -hmm. sale. You're providing them a valuable workshop. Yeah. Um, and, and that link to a ticketing website tells me that they're okay with it being a paid event. Yeah. Okay. A lot of, a lot of events are paid events. Yeah. It's, how, it's, it's why events are still a thing because someone needs to make money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <That's pretty> expensive. <laughs> they are. They're so expensive. All right. So Tracy has to leave in about three minutes, right? And it's snowing. So not, maybe. not yet here. I'm safe okay. so far. Okay. It's, it's coming down at least. Something. Okay. So can we do like a, a quick overview review bullet points for everybody that made it to the end? Sure. I, like, I love it. Thanks for hanging in with us guys. So um, events are valuable because they're shared experiences and it gives you an opportunity to move people from where they are to where you want them to be. And uh, for that, I really love events. You get to be creative and you have this audience that is basically held hostage to do what you tell them to do while you have them. And um, you don't get that virtually, not the same way. It yeah. gives you um, social network value when you have people influencing one another in attendance when they are already part of a community and they see that their friends are going. Um, and so you, you gain that as well. Uh, be really careful as you set up, read the boilerplate, um, know what's in the contract as far as what you can and can't do. There's very specific, it's not long, uh, but there are some gotchas in there. And um, I think that really LinkedIn events are gonna be a phenomenal place to start the conversation and to augment the conversation. Uh, they may not be the solution for every event, but they're a really great piece of a platform for increasing my professional network. And for that, I'm really excited about them. Awesome. Awesome. And I think the, the part where I think a lot of people will drop the ball is the effort that goes into the conversation after the event is created to build that momentum up until the event and then with the, the follow-up after it. I feel like that's so super critical and a lot of people won't do it. So do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Awesome. Talk to right, people. Any, talk to people. Tracy, thank you for your time. I'll, I'll get you the, the, the raw video file of this and awesome. put it up on YouTube too. All right? Sweet. All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Good to see y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.